So this project is, is called Above, Aerial Based Observations of Volcanic Emissions. This project all the way from the beginning has been about pushing boundaries, pushing boundaries of how we study volcanic emissions, changing the way we take our measurements and how can we use the rapid advances in modern technology recently to help us get better data, fill in some of the gaps in our knowledge of volcanic emissions globally. Also how we can integrate lots of different techniques all happening at the same time. So this project has really been about taking what we know, uh, looking at what we need to know, and then using technology to fill in those gaps. We chose Papua New Guinea for, for many reasons. We looked at our, our global data set of, of carbon emissions uh, around the world and identified gaps and why those gaps exist. And Papua New Guinea really stood out because it has some of the most strongly degassing volcanoes as measured from, from satellites in space and yet almost entirely lacks ground-based measurements. Both volcanoes we chose, Manam and Rabaul, are in the top 10 strongest sulphur dioxide emitters. And so we chose both of them as our targets because we wanted to demonstrate how drones could really make a step change in our, both our understanding of carbon emissions, but also towards getting that crucial number of what is the global flux of carbon dioxide from volcanoes. Volcanoes are the main recycler of carbon from the mantle to the atmosphere. What we want to know is how much of the carbon that comes out of a volcano is from the mantle and how much is from the subduction zone. And by looking at the isotopes, we can do that. We can then make a balance and understand how much of that subducted carbon actually goes beyond the volcanoes down into the deep mantle. So it's an important part of understanding the global deep carbon cycle. A more practical aspect of the project is to understand what is the volcano doing. The more things we can measure, the better it is for us to understand why volcanoes erupt and when they erupt. This is an instrument called the Multigas. These have been deployed on many, many volcanoes around the world and they play a really important role because changes in carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide chemistry are in the plume and the, and the ratio between them can be used to forecast volcanic unrest. So we put together this interdisciplinary team to develop sensors, sample collection systems that we can put on drones and fly into volcanoes. The idea was to measure carbon dioxide as we fly through the plume and in real time get the data back to the drone operator and then when the CO2 concentration is high enough we trigger a little pump that then takes the gas from the plume and puts it into this plastic bag. Then we take the plastic bag and analyze it for carbon isotopes. Yeah, oh here you go. Yeah. Volcanic gas straight from the crater of uh, Tavuvu. We can all already look at the concentration. So the ratio between those two tell us about the carbon isotope composition. There are volcanoes in this world which are too dangerous because they're too active. Drones are just forging this way forward to allow access to areas that wouldn't otherwise be accessible. We've come here with fixed wing drones and they have a great advantage because they've got a lot of performance in terms of getting to high altitude and long range. We've equipped them with some of the most powerful um, telemetry options we can find. So we're getting crystal clear uh, control link, uh, data reception and video reception on the ground, even when the drone is two kilometers altitude and five kilometers away from us at the summit. Titan aircraft we call them, that's the name of the airframe. I came here with two of these vehicles. They're great because you can hand launch them um, from pretty much any spot. And they've also got a parachute in them, which means they can also land pretty much anywhere. I 
they take all personal bags, tents, everything you need to live for the night. All that needs to go onto the boats as soon as possible. So, a bit of a group effort. <laughs> Just arrived, fantastic welcome by the village on the beach. Basically brought all the kid up here with the help of the locals and now we're just sort of settling in I think. So what an amazing day. Most welcome to this community Baliao on this island. I say good night and welcome. Every one of you. Thank you. So we're staying in a town called Baliao on, on Manam Island. There's around 3,000 people currently on Manam Island and most of them live in Baliao. Oh, Manam Island is, it's very beautiful. But sometimes only the volcanic eruptions depart, depart us from my, the highland to the mainland in the case centers. In 2004 it erupts and we were evacuated to the mainland. The Bailo people, we came back because of fighting in the case center, so we come back here. Yeah. So, so now we are living under a big risk here because of the Azadis volcanic eruptions. And those major eruptions were never addressed properly by, by the government. But since then, we, are, we have been waiting for 15 years. Nothing is happening. And we are regarded as uh, IDPs, internally displaced person on my own land. It's one of the unfortunate things about volcanic communities and the, the need to evacuate. When they do evacuate, there's just nowhere to go. The land is already full on the mainland or owned by other people. So what do you do with all these people that need somewhere to go because they can't stay on their homeland, but they also can't be rehomed for fear of conflict? It was quite sobering and it helps us to understand the deeper social context of what an evacuation really means for the people involved. We used to fear the mountain or volcano. Uh, sometimes we are happy because our highland, we, we grow up on this island and we are happy to live on our island. And we are happy, uh, helpful people. We love others. <laughs> The generosity from the local tribe has just been unimaginable and I've, I've been touched at every step of the way. Our equipment that we've been leaving outside uh, as permanent monitoring stations, within five or ten minutes the local people have constructed shelters out of wood, bamboo, fern leaves, they've woven roofs that are waterproof. Any equipment that needs uh, transporting, they've jumped at the chance to help us. None of this would have been possible without them. They want to learn, but at the same time they want to help, and we're extremely grateful. Every evening we've been trying to feed back a little bit of what we've learned each day, both from here and from other volcanoes around the world, to tell them a little bit about how their volcano sits in the global context. One of the, the biggest successes that, that I feel personally is how we've been collaborating with the local volcano observatory, the Rabaul Volcanological Observatory. We managed to secure some additional funding to provide equipment and also training for them in how to continue the measurements that we've been doing using drones for gas studies. So I have very high hopes that after we leave, the data set, at least at Tavirva, will continue uh, long after we've gone.
just had a traditional welcome ceremony from the, the Manam Islanders. I've never kicked off a field campaign in quite such style before. I think we're all really enthused now to go and start taking our measurements and start doing the work that we came here to do. Working in a country like Papua New Guinea, it's never going to be easy in terms of particularly logistics and just working in the field. But that's part of the reason why no ground-based measurements existed, because it's been extremely challenging. What we've got to remember is this is a remote island with no gas, electricity, water. So everything we're doing here is using the most basic facilities available to us. So we've bought tools, we've bought battery chargers. Charging was, is always the challenge, I think, on a trip like this. So many drones need so many batteries. Two different kinds of drone batteries charged, five computers, and we have two car batteries as well. We have some chaotic thing over here, but it works. All the drones, all the different types of instruments. I mean, everybody's working hard making it happen, but it's, you know, it's very, very ambitious. We're trying to push the boundaries, and when you push the boundaries, things will go wrong. It's challenging for the people who work here, it's challenging for the instruments. We've had instruments fail because of the heat. Well, uh, we were about to take off, but the, the computer shut down. It looks like it overheated, so the sun is, is really making a toll on the instruments. Once I had to put it in the freezer for a couple of minutes and then it worked again. It's 34 degrees. Okay. No way. That's too hot. <laughs> People have been working really hard to push the vehicles beyond uh, their design capability. The sheer magnitude of the volcano, that sort of 2,000 metre climb, that's not something that most drones are designed to do. So getting all the way to the plume is, is definitely a challenge. Oh! You're down. That's a crash. Why is it so bad? No. So we're just preparing to do a launch of the Titan. Uh, at the moment it's cloudy, but it takes maybe 20 minutes to prepare the Titan for launch, but hopefully it'll be clear by then. The first uh, challenge is the launch. So it's a hand launch. It's this moment when the vehicle goes to full thrust and you have to throw it into the sky and it, the autopilot takes over at that moment. And it's a very critical moment because the autopilot has to get the wings level, has to continue ascending. But shortly after that moment, everything becomes a little bit calmer. The thrust backs off, the autopilot's doing its job and starts navigating to the waypoints. Yep, off it goes. <laughs> When it goes into the turn, can you tell me what it recovers to? We set it at uh, maybe a 13 degree climb angle and it powers up in several large zigzag tracks, just back and forth into clean air until we reach 2,300 metres above sea level. Once we're at that, we fly directly towards the plume and we turn back. Yep. 
Okay, if it's 22.8, I am a go. Fantastic news. We're heading home. Ready? Titan has landed successfully in parachute mode. Disarm, please. Please disarm and confirm. <laughs> the SO2 value is a very clear indicator that we've hit the densest part of the plume. It's a great feeling. And then when they came over and said, we nailed it, we hit the plume, we were right through the middle. I ah, couldn't have been happier. Right from the beginning, this project was all about jumping us into the next decade of deep carbon science. We had three fantastic flights. We collected data for the first time at a volcano where it's never been monitored before. We achieved engineering feats that a year ago we wouldn't have even entertained the idea. But this is what this expedition has all been about, identifying what are the next steps both in, in science development but also in technology. Part of this project was to agree what's the best way of using drones for this kind of sensing. Due to the loss of vehicles and the challenges of vehicles overheating and braking in other ways, it's just proved that this is still a developing technology. Technology. There's still no clear way of doing this work and I really look forward to sitting down with the other teams and really trying to work out what is the best way of achieving these, these long-range uh, remote gas sensing missions. This project has brought together all the groups from all over the world working towards using drones in their science. We're all in one place, we're all learning from each other and this will really form the framework for, for what comes next and we hope to be able to continue this work.